It's time to take your seat in the front row with Mike Vaccaro. Here's your host, Mike Vaccaro. Hey, thank you, Chuck. Welcome, everybody, once again in the front row with Mike Vaccaro. I am your host, Mike Vaccaro. Behind the scenes, as always, it's JR Quitman, our show's creator, producer, and director. As always, we thank you for continuing to watch and listen to our shows, and I uh, hope you appreciated the last one that we had, episode number 44, with Eric Montross, former North Carolina Tar Heel, now an analyst on the basketball broadcast there for the Tar Heels. For the episode number 45, we're talking sports and Hollywood here today. Yes, a special guest joining us here today. It is Ed Marinero. Some people, older folks may know him as a former running back from Cornell and in the NFL with the Minnesota Vikings, the Jets, and the Seattle Seahawks as well. And then he had a second act as an actor with uh, so many roles, including Laverne and Shirley, his breakout role, and then Hill Street Blues back in the 80s, which made him a very popular man and certainly a well-known man, Ed Marinero, at that time. Well, another act for him, a third act, Blue Mountain State, a cult classic, a football series as well. He talks about all that with us, how he got into acting, and also, well, that viral moment that he had in the NFL draft here recently with the pick from the Vikings. This is a good one, folks. Episode number 45 of In the Front Row, it features Ed Marinero. And, um, again, Ed, I appreciate you spending a little time with us here to talk about not only your football career, but uh, your acting career as well. You're uh, certainly a dual threat guest that we've had here. And, and let's start at the very beginning for you. And let's start, you know, growing up back, uh, you know, I guess you were born in New York City, but grew up in New Jersey. Tell us the role sports played in your life at, at that point growing up. Well, you know, when I moved uh, from New York City, I mean, I literally was born in Manhattan. I lived on 10th Avenue um, in 16th Street, so right midtown. And, and I have early memories of, um, you know, being in New York City, playing on the on the streets in front of my, my grandfather had a grocery store. I spent a lot of time there and you know, running around the streets. Obviously it was a different New York city than it is now. But, um, then I moved to New Jersey and that's when I started, you know, getting involved in sports. I, I started little league baseball. Um, I think I was probably, you know, I was 10 years old, started playing Little League Baseball, and then kept playing baseball right up into high school. And when I was 12 years old, uh, my little town of New Milford, New Jersey, started a junior football league, you know, for, you know, young kids. Uh, what was it? I think the age is 9 to um, 13. And I played in that. That kind of introduced me to tackle football. And then um, high school, I started, you know, high school as a freshman, and I played freshman football, well, obviously, all, to my, all through varsity, and had a pretty good career. I was also a basketball player, and um, I actually had, was being recruited as a basketball player. I had a couple of scholarships, most notably, um, I had a scholarship offer from Davidson when Lefty Drizel was the head coach. And uh, Bobby Knight actually came to my high school to scout me uh, when he was at Army. And his, his assistant back then was Bill Parcells. Wow. And, I, and I, I, I got to know Bill. In fact, Bill did a cameo in Blue Mountain State, which was very funny. You know, because I got to know him, I reached out, would you do this? And he graciously did it. But when I first met Bill, because he's from, he grew up right around where I grew up. In yeah. Oradell, or River Edge, New Jersey. And um, he told me the story about it. He said, you won't remember this, but I came to your high school with Bobby Knight to scout you for basketball. So um, that was that was kind of a cool story. Um you know, it's just, uh, I think sports have, has been my, um, you know, it gave me a lot of direction, and discipline, and, you know, all the, the cliches you hear about, you know, athletics, and I really took advantage of, uh, really took advantage of it all. I mean, and now at this stage of my life, I look back at, at um, 
you know, I just look at the journey and it's, it's, it's kind of fascinating, you know, you just never know where, where it's going to take you or how are you going to do. And, you know, I was thinking about, I was just thinking about that. You know, I, I, you know, I never really, you know, you don't really know how good you are or good you can be. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a lot of people out there who just never get to the point where they can achieve their greatness. And, and it's somewhat serendipitous. I mean, you, you got to be really lucky. I was very lucky. I, I admit it. I mean, I took advantage of certain opportunities, but, you know, success in life, not to get philosophical on you, but <laughs> as I look back, success in life is uh, just, it's luck. It's a lot of luck. And um, the only thing you can do is pick a path. Hopefully you pick a path that you're passionate about and then um, be prepared when you might get an opportunity. It's a whole adage, you know, the luck is when preparation meets opportunity. And when you get, you never can be sure you're gonna get the opportunity, but the only thing you can really count on is being prepared. And, um, you know, I kind of, uh, I lived that. I lived that when I went to college and played an offense that was perfectly suited for my skill set. And, you know, it was, uh, when I think back, you know, I never ever expected to do what I did in college. It was kind of, I don't think anybody did, <laughs> but it was, it was fun. It was great. And here I am. Well, what you did in college was pretty darn good. You, you went to Cornell, you're wearing the hat there. So you, you def you said no lefty Drizel, no, no Bob Knight. I'm going to Cornell I'm playing football. You rushed for almost 5,000 yards in your career, and you were the runner up in 1971 to uh, the Heisman Trophy to Pat Sullivan from Auburn. So, so what made you so good? What made you so good? And I've seen you know, some things from you, you know, the Ivy League maybe not getting the respect that, that you think it should have, and, and maybe that hurt you from winning that Heisman. But obviously, you had an outstanding career. Yeah, I mean, you know, back then there was certainly uh, a prejudice, maybe you call it a stigma, being an Ivy League guy. They just sort of, uh, you know, we don't give scholarships, we don't give athletic scholarships, so that um, you know that cuts down the, the uh, you know, in the recruiting process when you can't offer somebody a scholarship. I mean, I probably had forty football scholarships uh, coming out of high school. You know, I was, I was, you know. A, football player, I was a basketball player. I think people recruited me more as a big, a pretty good athlete rather than just a football player, but you know, I could do a lot of stuff. Um, but you know, I don't know what it was. Maybe it's my blue collar background, my, you know, rather humble beginnings. I mean, it wasn't poor, but you know, we weren't rich. But I always, uh, I always put a high premium on, um, you know, uh, education. And even the perception, you know, I mean, going to an Ivy League school was just something that really resonated with me, you know, because I, I never thought of myself as being smart. But I, you know, to be able to be recruited by those schools and, and you know, be able to apply to those schools, I think I got into a couple of them. And it was like, uh, you know, I knew at a very young age that it was going to be much more meaningful. Uh, as life went on, it would sort of protect my future a little bit. Again, I I never expected to do what I did. I maybe I was being a little bit, uh, you know, I wanted to go someplace where I think I had a better chance to play. And you know, not to you know, no matter where you go to college, it's competitive. I mean, you, know, you go to a you know Ivy League school, and I guarantee you, every kid on the team is the best kid from their high school. You know, they don't get the, uh, the you know, the, well, what's the uh, the expression, uh, you know, the, the way they rate these high school kids. Um, yeah, five-star, four-star. Yeah, 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 yeah. We don't get five-star guys. Yeah. We get two-star guys who the good ones turn into five-star guys. You know, we get the kids that the 285-pound offensive tackle who by the time he's a junior, he's 315. Where Alabama gets the 315 right out of the bat. You know? So our guys are late bloomers in a lot of ways. And I think it's it's an interesting recruiting challenge for Ivy League 
coaches to um, be able to sort of project what a player might become. Because, you know, they were very, you know, again, I was, I was recruited. I got, I was, my first, uh, my first um, scholarship offer was from Penn State. And uh, that was pretty big time football. Yeah. And, you know, interesting little side bit. It was the same year that Franco Harris and Lydell Mitchell went to Penn State. They were, the three of us would have been there at the same time. And one of us wasn't going to play. And I'm not conceding it would have been me. <laughs> but, uh, you know, Franco is a good friend to this day. You know, we played against him in the Super Bowl. I was in the Vikings. Was, um, so that's kind of it. And Franco was being recruited by Cornell. And I was being recruited by Penn State. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think it's a, it's a special kid. And, and you know what? We, when I was a freshman at Cornell that year, 1960. Eight, the Ivy League had two first-round draft picks in the NFL. Marty Domery's quarterback from Columbia and Calvin Hill, running back from Yale, and they both went on to have you know, pretty good careers. Calvin, you know, who's all-pro running back, and so you know they we get a we, we we there's a guy for Harvard. I can't even remember his name. His last name was a Polish name with a J. Uh, who's playing, and there was a tight end I just saw from Harvard who was just playing last week. I forget what team he's on. But, you know, we get our we get our guys. We get enough of them. And, and you know, the, it, it's funny, and I'm sure to a certain extent it still exists, but, you know, when I went to Minnesota, they, they didn't they, – they, they looked at me like I had two heads. They uh, – you know, being an Ivy Leaguer, you know, they just assumed I was like this smart guy, you know. And, uh, I'm sure I took advantage of that, but uh, it was it was it was really kind of kind of funny, you know. They were a little standoffish about, you know, hesitant. A little bit. They still gave me a bunch of crap, but but I was the only rookie that they made sing every single night during training camp. We started out with 28 rookies. By the end of training camp, only six of us left, and I still sang every night. So they were, uh, they were pretty rough on me. Well, that was 1972. Was it was the purple Porsche part of the reason why? I, I heard you you showed up your first training camp in a purple Porsche. Oh, that was a beautiful car, man. I, uh, yeah, it was. Uh, <laughs> it was kind of you know it, it was sort of an accident that the car was purple because I really. You know, I was living in Manhattan, spent a lot of time in Manhattan, and I went to the Manhattan Porsche dealership, and I told them what kind of car I wanted. I want a Porsche. And uh, I described what I wanted, and they said, uh, well, it'll take three months. And I went, no, 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 no. <laughs> I want it now. <laughs> I'm leaving in about a month to go to training camp, and I have to have my new car. So they said, they said, there's a car over in Queens that, Somebody ordered it, but didn't like the final color. So I drive over to, to the Queen's Porsche Alley, and there's this Porsche, a Viking purple Porsche. I mean, it was the same exact color of the helmet. And I go, oh, man, I, I can't pull up to training camp. <laughs> In this purple Porsche. I mean, I hadn't even made the team yet. You know, I mean, you talk about arrogant. And I had a girlfriend at the time, and I said, I said, what do you think? She goes, do it, do it. So I bought the thing, and boy, it was, uh, it, it made a bit of a stir. I pulled up in Mankato, Minnesota, with, with all these uh, station wagons and pickup trucks. And I pulled in with my little Porsche. It was, I made an impression. <laughs> Yeah, again, this was 1972, drafted by the Vikings. So you, you're there for several years and some really good teams. Bud, uh, uh, Bud Grant was the head coach, right? Fran Tarkenton was uh, your quarterback during that time and the Purple people, people Eater defense as well. So you guys had it all together. You go to a couple of Super Bowls. What was that transition like for you going from the Ivy League to the NFL to such a good team in the Minnesota Vikings back in the early 70s? Well... It's kind of an interesting, you know, as, as I reflect back, you know, 
I played six years. I got injured with the Jets during my fifth year. And I was kind of off to a pretty good start. I, when I say pretty good, I, I, when the, the, I got hurt the seventh game of the season, and I had 200-yard rushing games in a row, um, which I'd never done in Minnesota. But when I look back, I don't know really why the Vikings drafted me. Because, you know, here I am uh, coming out of college. I average 40 carries a game as a running back. And when I went to Minnesota, the four years I was there, they used me primarily as a blocker and a pass receiver. And let me tell you something. Blocking was probably, learning how to block was my greatest athletic achievement in my life. Because these people that you're trying to block do not want to be blocked. And, you know, it's like I'd never done it. It's a tribute to what, what good athlete I was. I mean, there was a bit of a learning curve, you know, and when you have a quarterback like Tarkenton and you get a blitzing linebacker, you know, like Butkus is blitzing from the middle and you know, he runs over you, you know, and nails the quarterback. They, they don't hesitate to uh, give you an earful. So learning how to block, then learning how to pass block. I mean, I mean, I, I remember when we played in the, in the uh, NFC championship game against the Cowboys, I had, a, I had a dry block on Ed Tutol Jones. That was a play they put in. I had a wind up, boom, I went right at him, goes outside, just try to hit him. I mean, he beat the crap out of me, you know. I mean, I was like a sacrificial lamb. I'd go up there and just try to engage him, let him hit me and kick me and get me. But I, you know, I was going to knock him down. But, you know, and that was uh, – you know, they never really let me run the ball. Yeah, you ended your career with the Seahawks. You just said back-to-back 100-yard rushing games with the Jets and then Monday night football game that, that you basically ended your career more or less with the injury. But maybe the big thing that came out of that time with the Jets was Joe Nate and, and the association you got with him and the acting that started with that. Tell us a little bit about that and, and, and how Joe Namath maybe led to your second act in life and uh, your time in Hollywood. Well, you know, Joe and I have been friends for a long time. I met Joe. <laughs> I was introduced to Joe back in 1972, 71, 72, after my senior in college at the College Football Hall of Fame dinner in New York City. And someone had talked him into coming up to the table I was sitting at. I was with a bunch of Cornell alums who invited me to this dinner, which was, you know, kind of cool. And all of a sudden, there's a tap on my shoulder, and there's Joe Namath. And, you know, I'm like, you know, Joe Namath. And uh, we went to this, I was at the dinner, and, and um, Johnny Musso, I don't know if you remember that name, but Johnny Musso was a um, All-American running back for Alabama. At the time, we were both you know, on a lot of all these All-American teams, and I got to be friendly with Johnny, he's this good old boy from Alabama. So after the dinner, he comes up. He goes, "Yeah, Joe invited us over to come over and see Bachelor Three after the after the dinner. Come on, we gotta go over there." Uh, so I was with my brother. And we came, so we go, "Yeah." After the dinner's over, we get in a taxi cab, which was like a big deal. We were in a taxi cab. That was cool. Um, and we go over there and walk in, and we. So, uh, you know, Joe and me, we're friends of Joe's, and this girl, goes, yeah, they're in the back. We go in the back, and he's sitting back there with uh, his tight end, Pete Lamons, and a bunch of his friends. And he comes in, he goes, hey, boy, sit down. Just get deep. Now, God love him. Joe was just totally drunk, man. He was, it was funny. He was just, but he was, uh, he and I became really good friends. That year, he started the first, it was the first year of the Joe Namath football camp up in Vermont. And he invited me to be one of the instructors. I became good friends with his lawyer partner, Jimmy Walsh, who's still his business partner, lawyer in New York, who kind of orchestrated my move from Minnesota to the Jets. And uh, I worked at the camp with Joe and you know, they put him in this ski chalet. And, you know, 
We have to practice and we go over and we get in the steam and it's the, you know, it's, and I'm sitting there thinking, damn, I'm sitting here naked with your name. How cool <laughs> is that? <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, we still, friend, I just talked to him, um, you know, not too long ago. I FaceTime him and we catch up and he's just a, a legend, a great guy. And, you know, his career, you know, when I when I was hanging around with him, you know, he'd go to L.A. and I went with him a couple of times. He had a he had an agent. And, uh, so he introduced me to the agent. That's sort of how I got got into, uh, into acting. I mean, I didn't have the Joe Namath name, so my route was a little bit more, um, you know, I, I, I worked really hard. Yeah, it certainly worked out for you. So it's in 72, you drive – Purple Porsche to the first, you know, training camp for the Vikings. And it's a gold Porsche that you drove all the way out to Hollywood as well. Led to your first role. And it was a role in a mob movie that also featured another pretty good running back uh, from the NFL as well in, in Jim Brown. What was it like, your, your first major role that you had like that? That was, what was that, Fingers? Yeah, that was the movie Fingers. Yeah, with Harvey Keitel. And uh, I actually did that when I was still playing football. When I went okay. with the Jets, because we actually shot that in New York City. And uh, the director was a guy named Jim Toback. He wrote it. And um, I met him through, oh, you know how I met him? The guy who was producing the movie was, uh, his name is Richard Barry. And Richard Barry's family owned Fabergé. Cool. And Joe had was the Fabergé guy. And I actually did a, commercial for Fabergé. So when they were doing this movie, uh, Richard Barry, you know, said, well, we got a part for Ed, you know? It was a, you know, I think I was in two scenes, but it was pretty cool, you know, being on the set. I was with uh, Harvey Keitel, who was a great actor, and, and uh, Danny Aiello, God rest his soul, was another, you know, person in the movie. It was Tia Farrow, Mia Farrow's sister. It was kind of a cultish movie, but, um, yeah, that was, uh, <laughs> you know, I just, look, I I had no idea what I was doing. But, you know, I, I was a single guy. And my career, you know, I probably, had I played, I was probably one of those guys, if I didn't get hurt, I would have played, I played six years, I would have probably been a 10-year guy. You know, I could have played 10, 11 years. I was just a, you know, Adorable, reliable, you know, kind of guy. And uh, had I played that long, I would have never gone to Hollywood. But I was still young enough. And I was single, okay? And had I been married, maybe with a kid or two, I mean, I don't think I would have said to my wife, honey, I'm going to Hollywood, I'm going to be an actor. Come on, let's do this. You know, I would have got a real job. And by the way, I probably would have got a really good job because, you know, my background, you know, my major at Cornell was hotel and restaurant management, which is uh, probably the most renowned school in the world for that. So, I mean, I would have had no trouble getting a, a job, you know. So, you know, I just took a shot. I moved out there and, um, it, studied and you know really tried to work at being a real actor i was working with real actors i mean you know um so you know i i i, I took the craft very seriously and early on i wanted to be a good actor and and i and i you know i took me a couple of years before i got my first uh you know first meaningful role I mean, my first role was one line. I played a hairdresser. My second role was six lines. And then I got, probably my first big break was on Laverne and Shirley. I was cast uh, as this Italian immigrant, one of uh, Laverne's cousins, which led to a regular, like I did a half a season the next year but playing a different character. So that got me, you know, sort of on the radar a little bit. It was a great, you know, great experience. And then they fired me, which was devastating at the time. But 
about three months after they fired me, I got Hill Street Blues. And the rest is history. Six years I did on Hill Street Blues, which was, you know, probably the biggest break an actor could get. It gave me credibility that I probably didn't deserve because I was working with so many really talented actors, writers, directors. I mean, the writer on that show was like incredible. It was almost actor proof. You had to be really bad to screw up the stuff that they asked us to do. So I was really lucky, you know, it, 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 <laughs> you know, during that time, you know, again, it was just wonderful writing. I, I used to, I, I did a lot of movies for television. You know, was, you know, Thursday night NBC movies. And most of them were like women in distress. And I would play the boyfriend. I'd play the good boyfriend or the idiot boyfriend. But I was the boyfriend. And the writing on those movies was so horrible. It was like, I, I would almost have to stop myself from laughing with stuff they had me say, you know. Um, I always tell people, you know, the woman in peril movie, I was the boyfriend in every movie. I had the same, I would say a, certain, a version of the same line. i go, don't you think you're being a little hard on yourself? Every movie. Yeah, that was really good. That was, a, see, you, got, <laughs> you perfected it right there. <laughs> Yeah, that was, that was, uh, you know, that was, it was, it was fun, you know, and then I just kept working. I did another series called Sisters. I would do movies every year. You know, I looked at, you know, I look at my um, IMBD thing and there's stuff I did I don't remember doing. And, um, you know, I've, I've had a, I've had a career that most people would love to have. And, you know, I'm still, you know, kind of involved. I don't work as much. You know, I, I don't, uh, you know, I don't pursue it as much as I probably should or could. And if something comes along that I want to do, I'll do it. But I, you know, I really don't, I don't like to travel as much. You know, I, I, the last thing I did was a couple, not the last thing, but I did something a couple years ago where I shot in Vancouver. I live in Charleston. It was not, it's just not fun. It's just not fun being, being away, staying in a hotel, getting up early. You know? It doesn't have the allure that it had, you know, back in, you know, when I was in my thirties and forties, but, you know, I still get opportunities to, you know, thank goodness for technology, just like what we're doing today. You know, I can do auditions on my phone. You know, my agents will send me, you know, they want you to audition for this. And they send me all the information. And, you know, I set it up and my, my wife reads the other role. And I, you know, do my thing and send it to my agent. And that's it. Which, without that technology, I'd be out of the business. Because, you know, I, I wasn't, every time I had one of these auditions, most of them were in, LA or New York, I ain't flying back for an audition. Uh, there's probably a 98% chance I'm not going to get the part. So it's, so it's, uh, it, that's, that's sort of a good thing. It sort of keeps me, you know, engaged. You know, people ask me, are you still acting? I said, I said, look, actors, they don't retire. Actors either can't remember their lines anymore or they die. Otherwise, you're always an actor, and you know. It's, it's obviously, you, know, you get to this stage in my life, being an older actor, I'm competing against all these other old son of guns who stayed alive for a long time too. So, you know, and there aren't that many roles, and there's a lot of competition for those roles of old guys. You know, well, I'm being self-deprecating, and you know, I feel like I'm I do pretty well. You know? Yeah, yeah, you're early 70s. You're, you're doing great. Um, let, let's talk about that role, Hill Street Blues. And, and again, 81 to 86. And that was just supposed to be a guest starring role, right? And, and it became a lot bigger than that. Um, what was it about that show? Because it won a lot of Emmys. Stephen Bochco was, you know, part creator of that show, was, you know, innovative at the time as well. What was it about that show? 
Well, it, it, one of the big kind of um, what made it really special at that time was the way it was shot. You know, it was, uh, you know, everybody was used to like the Chips and Charlie's Angels and, you know, these pretty shows, you know. And this show just, you know, sort of defied conventional wisdom on what was, you know, a cop show. You know, they called us, I remember one review said we were the most unattractive cast in television, aside from Veronica Hamill, who was really good looking. But, um, you know, they shot it messy. It wasn't glamour shots. Um, and it portrayed, it was a cop show, but it wasn't about cops. It's about the people who were the cops. And that was refreshing and new. You know, nobody was a superhero. Everybody was flawed. And people didn't quite know how to take it, but they knew it was you know, provocative and, and it kept your attention because it was just so different for that time. And after that, everybody started doing what we did. But we were the originals, you know, just uh, from a cinematic uh, standpoint, it was, you know, like messy. You know, we, did, we would do a handheld cameras and we would do big, big, long uh, master shots that would go for like, three or four minutes where you'd never have a break in the camera. They go from here and then they go here and then they, and you had to really focus and pay attention because if you were the last part of that, that, that shot and you screwed up, they had to do it all over again. So it was, uh, it, it was exciting. And you know, and at the time, I mean, no one, none of us knew what it was or what it was going to become. Mm -hmm. You know, these are a lot of journeyman actors were on the show you know, I certainly, I mean, I did a guest spot where I was supposed to get killed, and I did four episodes. I did the last four episodes of the first season. They did 13 episodes, and NBC picked them up for four more. And I was, you know, I, I, they asked me to read, my agent called it, there's this show, Hill Street Blues, and so I, you know, I, yeah, so I'll never forget, I go there, and no, you know how it happened? You talk about, again, when I mentioned about luck. You know how that happened? My agent called me and said, there's a movie they're doing about a male stripper. And there's some parts in there that, you know, you could probably do. I go, okay. So my agent says, listen, um, it's over at the, this, you know, Radford studio. So when you go there, I'm going to call the casting person for uh, Hill Street Blues. It's a new show. You know, you, you maybe you stop by and say hello. It's Jerry Windsor. He goes, okay. So I go to there. Then I have, an, I have two appointments. One for the movie. So I pull up, park my car outside. I'm walking into the, you know, in the studio through the gates, give my name, and I run into an actor friend of mine from my acting class, um, who was. Uh, Actually, he had a very popular hit song. His name is Mel Carter. I don't know, you wouldn't remember that name, but he had a really popular song in the 60s. Hold me, hold me, never let me go. Yeah. It was a popular song, but he was in my acting. I remember that. So he says, I said, what are you doing? He goes, ah, I'm going, I'm going over to Hill Street Blues, this new show, and you know, there's a role, you know, I'm just gonna you know, this. I go, hey, I'm going over too. So I went over with him. So I go in the lobby and there's all these, uh, it, it was funny because they were all casting, I guess, a role for a black guy. And there were all these black actors in there, Mel's African-Americans, you know. So I'm there and, and, and you know, uh, I go to the reception. I go, hi, I'm in Marinero. My agent said to stop by to see Jerry Windsor. And, and, and she goes, yeah, well, she's on her way over. She'll be here. So I thought Jerry Windsor was a guy, but it turned out it was a girl woman so Mel I'm sitting here talking to Mel and he goes there's uh, Jerry Windsor so I go oh I, I said I said I, I said Jerry I'm a mid arrow my agent uh, said to stop by and she goes and oh, uh, thanks for coming by but look, I, I'm, I have to audition all these guys do me a favor have your agent call and we'll reschedule the appointment I go okay okay 
So she goes off, and I'm, you know, I'm standing there. You know, I said to my friend Mel, I said, hey, well, good luck, good luck, you know, and um, I'll, see, you know, I'll see you in acting class tonight. He goes, yeah. Man. So then I hear this voice, and somebody's going, Ed, Ed. So Mel goes, Ed, Jerry Windsor's calling me. So I go, oh, yeah. I go over and I go, hey. She goes, she goes listen, um, we have a part here, this script of this show we're doing. You know, would you read for it? Would you audition? And I go, sure. So she says, well, here's the, here are the scenes. Um, I, let me audition these guys, and you work on it outside. And, you know, so I go, so I sit on the steps, scan, and I'm, you know, I'm re going through this. Never saw the material before, but I'm looking through it. And so, you know, probably, I don't know, half hour, 40 minutes later, she calls me in, and I go in there, and all of these, all these producers and the casting director, and, and, and Stephen Boschko wasn't there. But Michael Kozel, who was the co-creator, he was there, and you know, you know, they said that they made some jokes about football and everything. So I read for the role, uh, you know, and, and I'm reading with my the casting person, but she's playing the role of Betty Thomas, who was my partner during the show. So I read this, I'm reading this scene, and I'm, you know, I'm killing it. I'm not, it felt so good, it just felt so natural. So they. I remember they they, they were kind of they sort of laughed. They go, <laughs> well, that, was, "That was really good." <laughs> they said, "Would you do it?" Would you? They said, "Would you try it this way?" And I go, "Yeah." So I do it again, and I go, "I, I said, what is that it?" I go, "Yeah." I go, "Thanks, guys. Great meeting you." I get up and I walk out. I get in my car and I'm driving. I'm driving. <laughs> I, I remember this so well. I'm driving to a friend of mine's house because I'm taking voice lessons singing lessons just to increase to improve the quality of my voice you know if you can sing you can back and i'm doing everything i'm taking dance lessons i'm doing all this crap to, you know so i'm driving and, and i remember i had the, the phone in the car in the in the glove compartment in the old days where they it had a a, a cord to it and you know it was like really just crazy and i, and I call my age i say hey john I guarantee you, I got this part. He goes, "Oh, all right, you sure?" I, go, I guarantee they're going to be calling you. All right, boom. I go to my agent, calls me up later. He goes, "You're right, man. You got it. It's four episodes, but you die at the end." So I go, "What? I don't care. I mean, four episodes, and they were paying me twenty five hundred an episode, so I was going to make ten thousand dollars, which was pretty good." And you know, I was working. No idea about this show. I'd never seen it. So I, you know, I, I go and I, you know, I do the first episode and second episode. I mean, I just got along just so well with everybody, and I was, I fit right in. You know, was, there were great guys, girls. Everything about it was it was it was very cool. It was very cool to be involved in this, uh, you know, this special creative environment that you know I'm I'm just new to all this stuff. So it was, you know, I knew it was kind of. I, I didn't know how special it was, but it was it was fun. So, you know, I do the, the, these these four episodes, and I'm doing the fourth episode, and I'm, I'm shooting downtown Los Angeles, and it's the day I'm getting killed. And where the scene is, I walk up to the to this car. We pull over a car, and I walk up, and I go, "License and registration," and a shotgun comes out of the window. Boom! Blows me away. So, you know, I go to work that day, you know, know I'm doing it at that scene. And I go in my trailer and, you know, every, every time they would make, they would make changes to the script all the time. Okay. The first script you would get would be all white pages. And then every day, if they made changes, they changed the color. You know, they put blue, pink. That those were the pages where the scene had changed a little bit from the first, the original. So I go in there and I'm, I go, hmm. So I go and I open the script and I turn to the page where I get killed, after I get killed. And it says, um, in the original script, it said, how's everybody doing? And they said, you know how it is when you lose one of your, your guys. It's not good. They're all down. 
I get this new script and it says, how's everybody doing? Well, we don't know. Coffee's still at the hospital. So I said, oh my God. <laughs> you made the cut. You made the cut, right? But, but they did two endings. We shot two endings. One where they had a stunt man and I take it right in the chest. I'm done. You know, they had a stunt man. They whipped him back into the, you know. Then they had the other one where I go like this and they just, they just get me under the arm. So Botch goes on the set that day and he pulls me over and he goes, he goes, I just want you to know Joe Coffey's life right now is in the hands of your agent. <laughs> <laughs> so they negotiated a deal. You know, we, you know, for the, for the success of the show, none of us, none of us, they didn't pay us the kind of money that some of these other sure. you know, guys from Chips were making, you know, 100 grand an episode. I wasn't making it. Anyway. Yeah, four episodes led to 104 episodes. Finally, you, Joe Coffey did get get killed, but but that was by design on, on your end? You, you wanted to move on at that point? Yeah. You know what? I, uh, you know, I was at a perfect time in my life. I was, you know, young. I was only, I wasn't even 40 yet. I, you know, still looked good, you know, still there were a lot of roles I could do. And, you know, I was working a lot. And, um, I made a deal with them that I would do, I think I did, the, they did seven seasons. And I said I would do, I negotiated my, my thing, 19 episodes of the sixth season, then get killed. And I didn't do the third, the, fourth, the seventh season. Because, you know, I was pretty confident, in, you know, where my career was going. And I, and I knew the show was only going to be on one more year. I knew that. I mean, I know that nobody wanted to do more. It wasn't a real appetite for it, you know, from any of the actors. And, you know, everybody was ready to move on. It was a pretty demanding show. And I, I said, you know, instead of being one of like 13 actors who were out of work, you know, all the I said, let me... Let me do it now. I'll get some attention, get some press for it. I'll get, do some, you know. I didn't really, you know, the money was not a big deal because I, you know, I made more money the year I left the show than I did when I was doing the show. So, you know, I did six six years. And, you know, I really think actors are really not meant to play the same role for six years. I think it, it becomes, it's just, you know, the one fun thing about acting, I mean, I'm not, you know, I, it's great to have a steady gig, you know, because Hollywood is not about that, you know, you know I mean, not that I didn't enjoy, you know, working, knowing I had a job for four, five, six years. Um, but I think you lose your creative edge, you know, you start to become a caricature of the role you played. And I saw that the first, I'd say the first three years of Hill Street Blues were incredibly good. They were, you know, they were really, really good. But then the actors started to get a little distracted and, you know, they started becoming, you know, like uh, cliche of themselves. And, and, you know, I mean, it was still a good show. And, and, and what happens with success is, you know, the first three years we had the same group of writers who were really good. And then with success, these act, these writers, they just, you know, now they have some, you know, clout. They all writing their own scripts. They sell these scripts to networks and then they go off and they do their own shows. And you have a big turnover after a certain amount of time with, with, with writers and, and, Inevitably, the quality changes because you know when you're when you're a writer and you're writing something that already exists, you know, and you want to make your own statement. Yeah, I, I don't mean to get you know. Yeah, it's, 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 it's tough. I mean, like, like you said, you were innovative at the very beginning. It's tough to continue to do that. You know, totally, with totally. anything, and certainly with TV shows. That's why you're seeing all these TV shows and movies come back and in, in you know second versions of those and different things of that nature. So, so you leave there again, a lot of TV, a lot of movies, but eventually for you, you, you find another calling with, with Blue Mountain State. 
this became right. a, a cult movie. People that probably knew nothing of Ed Marinero with, with football, nothing about Hill Street Blues, all of a sudden knew about you. Take us through that and, and you know, why did you say yes to that role and, and how surprised maybe you were of the success and notoriety you got because of that? Well, you know what? It's really kind of exciting for a guy at this stage of his life to have a fan base of 20 something years. <laughs> it's um i mean i never knew i could never imagine it would turn into what it's turned into and it's pretty uh it's pretty cool i mean i gotta admit you know i mean uh you know it started out i i, I was i was the first actor to read for the role of marty daniels coach marty daniels the first actor first actor and I could say I just nailed it. I mean, I, 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 they knew who I was, and I, it certainly, I don't think it hurt me knowing that I was actually an ex-pro football player, you know. So it, it gave it a little panache, and, and, you know, it was just, it was so much fun. Man, those were three of the most fun, everything about it was fun. Doing comedy, especially doing that raunchy stuff, man, I, I you know, I, God, it was it was crazy. The stuff that I got to do, you know, I had strippers sitting on my lap, and you know, Denise Richards was my wife. I got to do makeout scenes with her. I mean, it was it was so much fun, and I never thought it would turn into what it it turned into. Um, and you know, our world changed really quickly and they were ready we were i was signed sealed and delivered to do another movie this one was actually being financed the first movie we did was crowdfunded which we, our budget wasn't that great we couldn't really do what we wanted to do but the next movie Lionsgate, was all in okay and then the world kind of changed um you know, we were, we were, we did a lot of, you know, farcical, over the top stuff, especially with drugs. And then the uh, opioid ep epidemic hit, and these young kids were dying. So recreational drug use was not considered funny anymore. And we did a lot of that. I mean, we, we did everything. We were the team from hell. I mean, if you ever watched the show, it was. Um, I'm not sure the Me Too movement was, was, I think the girls made all the guys look stupid in that show. You know, it's, uh, the guys, the girls were getting over on the guys more than, the, you know, the guys getting over on the girls. So they, I don't think it was a women's lib issue. Um, if you watch the show. So, you know, that was kind of, uh, I was very disappointed. We were going to do a sports season. And, you know, I was all ready to go. And then I got the news that the, network, the uh, studio didn't want to do it. So then it gets picked up by Netflix, which is really what made it the cult hit that it is. Because it's all about these college kids who were too young to watch it when it was on. You know, they might have been like 15, 16. So five years later, they're in college. And it's like required viewing for these kids. They still think the shit's funny. You know, I mean, they're, they're laughing at all this stuff that everybody's afraid of, you know, because they know it's sort of farcical. You know, if anybody would do what we were doing. You know? And they would binge watch this thing. You know, they, I mean, I can't tell you how many people, it's crazy. It's crazy. I mean, I, you know, I go in airports everywhere I go, you know, these people look at me and go, Oh my God! Oh my God, Coach, Coach! You know, I mean, so it's 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 hysterical, and and you know they they was can I get my picture with you, yeah, man? And it's uh, you know it's it's just really kind of fun to to still be kind of relevant. You know, I mean, I have I have uh, obviously fans from football who are like older, 
Then I have fans from Hill Street Blues, which is they're old now too. But then I have this whole different fan base. It's the gift that keeps giving because it's sort of like a, a rite of passage that these young kids, even today, you know, my son's up at Cornell, all his teammates, they, you know, they quote lines from the show to me, you know, it's, it's, uh, it, it's amazing. And, and it's, um, it's just been fun. You know, it's the, the problem when you're, you know, you, you get older, you've done a lot of stuff, you know, you're, you kind of lived a famous life, you know, and, Inevitably, we all become irrelevant, you know, where, you know, and a lot of people make these desperate moves to stay relevant. They say social media has given people the opportunity to you know, say and do really stupid stuff just so they'll get back in a headline or whatever. And that's one thing that I've, you know, I don't want to get about any of that, that stuff. You know, I dabble in social media occasionally, but you know, I'm not, I'm not gonna, you know, and believe me, I could say some stuff if I wanted to, you know, if I wanted to, you know, get a headline, you know, say yeah. something outrageous, I could talk about football, I could talk about a lot of stuff. I don't really care about doing that. But to have like these young kids really kind of like uh, just embracing the character, it's, it's, it's amazing. And it's, like I said, it's like a gift that keeps giving because, you know, again, it comes like these kids are still watching it in, in, in college. And, and this has been going on for 10, 10 years now, 12 years. The oldest fans now are in their early 30s. Yeah. Yeah, it they was 2010, 2011, right, that, that it aired the first time. Oh, no, I know. And these kids, if you were in college then, you watched it and then you, you know, you rewatched it and now you're in your 30s. It's just amazing. And, and girls, there's girls, you know, uh, I remember, the, uh, you know, I played in the uh, Craft Nabisco Pro Am. It's a ladies LPGA tour event doing Palm Springs. I played in it, and you know, they matched us with these lady golfers. And my partner, my my pro was Michelle Wee. <laughs> you remember Michelle? Very yeah, yeah. A really pretty, pretty tall, statuesque, you know, girl. And so I'm going to the first tee. And she comes running over to me. She goes, hi, hey, um, I'm Michelle. Um, I was so excited when I found out I was playing with you today. I'm, I'm just, we, I watched, I used to watch your show with all the Stanford football players, you know, every Tuesday night. She goes, would you mind, would you have to take a picture with me? I go, would I mind? No. <laughs> so, you know, it was, it, was, it was just interesting to see who the people who will admit to watching it anyway. Yeah, I mean, uh, you've had many acts to your life and your career, as you said, with, with football and Hill Street Blues and, and, and Blue Mountain State. Maybe your latest one as well. You went viral during the NFL draft. I know that was something as well. You had the, the purple jacket on. Tell us about that moment as well, because, you know, it was very interesting. You had the Vikings uh, draft pick that day. Well, you know, it was it was interesting because – you know, they invited me to do this this draft. And I honestly have never watched the NFL draft. Okay. Kind of knew a little bit about, you know, very little. So they invite me to uh, the, the Vikings call me and they first they brought me to Minnesota the night before the draft. And I did the local draft party at the stadium and I signed autographs and stuff like that. Then the next day I flew to Vegas with my wife and we we did the uh this draft party. So, you know, I go to, I, I forget where they were doing it. I think it was at the Bellagio Hotel, but they, they created this whole deal. It was like incredible. And uh, so I get there and I, I go in the green room and, you know, everybody was, it was so cool. I mean, you know, like Barry Sanders, Larry Zonka, you know, all these players and, um, uh, Sebastian Malaskosko, who's a funny, funny comedian, was there. Uh, Peels from the comedy team. It was like a really cool. So I'm back there, and they tell me I'm I'm going to. Uh, they told me when you know I was going to go on, 
they're going to announce this. But first, they brought us all out on this big stage. And I mean, it big crowd went forever. I'd never been in, I hadn't been in front of that many people hardly ever. It was like, I felt like I was uh, at Woodstock or, you know, I was the Pope. And they introduced, we, we were out there and waving, everybody's taking pictures. So then we go back in and, and one by one, they'd go out there and somebody would announce the draft. Now I'm back there and, uh, you know, I'm just chatting with everybody. And I, and I, I asked one of the, the women the, the, who run around with all the headphones, I said, I said, come here, sir. What do I do when I go out? Are you going to give me something? Yeah, yeah, we'll give you a card. I said, okay. I says, do you, do I, do I say anything? And they go, well, yeah, whatever you want. I go, I mean, can I have some fun? Go, oh, yeah. yeah have some. I go, okay. Now I'm sitting back there. I, they, they told me when I was supposed to go on, and then the Vikings traded their draft pick, so they come back and say, listen, you're not going on for another 45 minutes. I say, okay. So, you know, I throw down another brewski. And um, so then, then my they trade the Vikings traded again, and they go, you got to go out there right now. So I go out there, and I walk out there, and I mean the crowd is just you know it's overwhelming. You got to admit I never. So I you know I do my little shtick, and um, it lasted maybe three minutes. But I wasn't watching what anybody else had done. And, and evidently, everybody had gone out there. And, you know, they, 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 or for the third pick, blah, 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 you know. I'm in the entertainment business. I mean, I wasn't going to give up this opportunity to be in that many friends, that many people, and not really take advantage of it, okay? I'm a ham. <laughs> so I, I, I do my thing, and, you know, and, and the crowd's laughing, they're cheering and everything, and, and you know. I threw in a little blue mouth day thing, and then the, this girl comes out, and she she like, I mean, I'm I'm going, what? Oh, and they booed her. <laughs> they booed her. They'll say that that I was booed. No, they booed her when she came out. So I did the thing, and boy, the internet just blew up. I mean, I got mostly positive stuff mostly positive stuff you know people say oh you were the best thing that was so funny that was so great and then i got some really nasty stuff i mean that was my first time being like attacked on social media from you know that's the scary part of social media that they give people who are nobodies the ability to attack somebody like me personally you know, who they only wish that they had the life that I lived. And then you have these losers who, because of social media, you give voice to people who really have no authority to opine about almost anything, okay? But that's that's social media, and that's probably the worst part of social media, you know, that um, you give voice to people who don't really earn a voice. So, I mean, I got, you know, I got attacked by people calling me all kinds of names and you know re read the read the card you know you're taking away from this guy's you know this kid who like announced it jeff he's going to remember that more than anything else i mean it was like he's going to be like associated with you could have a joke and laugh about it whatever i mean it wasn't what i did was was terrible but, um you know i'm i had fun with it i thought it was kind of funny and you know i i said uh you know, I made a reference to being drafted by Green Bay, which is probably the truth. I mean, it, I, I, there probably isn't a player who was part of that draft who, if you had asked him before the draft, what team would you like to go to? No one would have said Green Bay. <laughs> and I think if, if you really did an anonymous poll, they say, what would be the last team you want to go to? It would be Green Bay. And I brought it up, and people laughed about it. But that's that's the reality. So, uh, so that's where the social media—that's where the mean ones came from. From Green Bay, everybody else, like no, you said, right at the moment. No, I don't think it was. I don't think there were Green Bay people. I just think it was, uh, you know, people who take this whole draft thing too seriously. I, I obviously, I didn't. I mean, to me, it was like you know, 
and um, they flew me to Vegas and we got to eat a good restaurant there and I had some fun. I got to see some people. I thought it was, you know, the one thing that people did say that, you know, that it was, you know, entertaining. And I, and I you know, I would think they want it to be a little entertaining. I mean, I, I think it was the only thing they talked about, which is, if I'm the only thing you're going to talk about, then it's pretty boring. And, uh, you know, I think that they should have more fun with it. You know, they make it, again, I didn't see one other person, you know, there were TVs. I didn't know what everybody else was doing. I had no idea. So I did my own thing and, and you know, I was, I'm not sorry I did. I don't know if the Vikings, if the Vikings were smart, they'd invite me back next year. But they probably <laughs> Yes, yes, you're right. You need an encore performance. You're an entertainer. What what what, what do they expect, right? So yeah, uh, I mean, I, I told you, I said it was three freaking minutes. I said three minutes of your life was it that was it that painful? <laughs> funny, funny. Well, we're almost done here. You know, obviously now, like you said, you've you've left Hollywood uh, a while ago. You live in Charleston. You you raised your son there, uh, Eddie, who's now on the the Cornell football team as well. What's what's that like? to be the dad now and to, to see him kind of following your footsteps a little bit with the, uh, with Cornell. Well, you know what? I, I, obviously I have very strong ties to Cornell, you know, it kind of shaped my life, you know, as we spoke about, it gave me a kind of confidence, um, you know, just I, that, that, that's probably the greatest accomplishment of my life. I mean, getting into Cornell, graduating from Cornell, representing Cornell for the last 50 years and everything I've done, you know, it's always in pro football, obviously, you know, play ball at Cornell, you know, but I'm very proud of that. I'm very proud of my friends. It's an incredible support, alumni support group. I think that's what makes, you know, a school like Cornell Sort of special. I mean, the, the alumni, you know, have a you know, kind of a strong bond, and, and being able to send my son there, um, you know, I'm I'm really proud of him, and I and, I, and you know, he I think he shares the, he understands what the value is of that education, and uh, you know, I'm I I've, I just you know I, I I did a little tweet. I watched. Deion Sanders. I don't know if you saw that last night. He was on 60 Minutes and he talked about yeah. you know, what he's doing at Jackson State, you know, and it was all about football, football, football. And I, and I, you know, I just couldn't help but, you know, I said, um, you know, it's very admirable what he's doing and blah, 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 but he never mentioned education once in his whole thing. And, you know, that's where, we, you know, we kind of, um, you can get really lost in, in, in you know, and I think this whole NIL thing <laughs> is just counterintuitive to what amateur athletics is supposed to be all about. I think it's going to ruin, <laughs> you know, football or, or college sports. There was a purity, you know, whether it was true or not, you know, it was, it was, it was something that you really kind of embrace, you know, the, the, amateur athlete there was a purity about it that's gone it's gone and, and you know it's 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 just beginning it's going to get ugly it's going to get stupid it's going to you know the ivy league i mean even though they they're eligible for those kind of things i don't think it'll ever who knows i mean it's just it's just disappointing that uh, you know like i always told people you know when you get a scholarship you're, they're paying for your education, which to the average kid, I don't care where you go, it's 10, 15, 20. I don't want to tell you what I'm paying for Cornell. Um, that's what you, that's, you get a free education because you play football. Education that other kids are paying for, but you get yours for free because you're playing football. For you to feel like you need to get paid and on top of that, you are getting paid. You're getting a free education. And and people, you know, like they've lost the value of that. They don't understand or appreciate that. And and you know, I'm, I'm old fashioned. I'm old school. You know, um, 
you know, I, I think that uh, the amount of the, the percentage of people who play college football that are going to play pro football is so small. And you kind of, you're distorting the value in these kids when you make, you know, in college, you, you, you sort of let them believe that they are really worth a lot, you know, and most of them will never go beyond, you know, college. So it's, um, you know, I think you have to emphasize the academic part of it more and more, and, and they're doing it less and less. So that's one thing I got to say about the Ivy League, you know, they, you got to be a, you got to, my son works really hard academically because he has to. And, and it's the way it should be, you know, student athlete. That phrase is, you know, nobody even says that anymore. Student athlete. Student first, athlete second. Yeah, it's, it's definitely a different time when you look at college athletics and, and, and the world we live in right now. Uh, for you, uh, again, you're, you're, you're on social media. You, you found this uh, third act, if you will, with, with Blue Mountain State. How can people follow you? Uh, how can they, they see you on social media and still see what you're doing out there? Um, I guess you just search me. You know, just search Ed Marinaro. I mean, I, I, I think I have uh, I think I have one Instagram with Coach Marty on there and you know i'm really not good at it and my son just you know he tells me be careful of being stupid you know i uh i tweeted about this uh, that kelsey tight end for the chiefs um i tweeted something about how he just always gets open i can't believe how this and i i spelled his name wrong and you know a few people pointed that out you know it's a big deal you know who i'm talking about <laughs> and my son said, Dad, you have to proofread what you send out. You can't just send it out. Didn't they teach you that? <laughs> so, <laughs> I said, no, they didn't teach me anything about social media when I was in college. Yeah, not, not back in the, the 70s. That wasn't uh, wasn't something you had to worry about back then. But Oh, my God, when you think about how, you know, how easy it is for athletes to get publicity, you know, and, it was, it was, you know, and when I played in the NFL, you know, there were, there was, I just, I was part of the first like Monday night football, but that just started when I was started. And then, um, you know, how many games there are and, and, and everything was on television. You know, it used to be, you know, in, in, when the Vikings were playing at home in Minnesota, you know, you couldn't get the Viking game. You know, you got some other game, and uh, you know, you get one other game. It was before Monday Night Football, Thursday Night Football. You know, the exposure was not nearly, nearly what it what it. And nothing. You can't even compare. I mean, we're it was so different back then in so many ways. Um, you know, one football game a week. I grew up in New Jersey. We get one game. We get to see the, the Giants. And then we get the Jets, and if the um, if the Giants were, you know, we never we wouldn't get home Giant games, only away Giant games. I think they we they put on a game that no one cared about. So. Yeah, it's, it's it's definitely definitely a different time for sure. But at least you're able to follow your, your Vikings a little bit now. Um, and I can't thank you enough for for spending some time with us. And uh, again. As you said, you were prepared for every opportunity that you had in life and so many different opportunities that you did have and uh, certainly a, an, a, an amazing career and the acting career that continues on. We wish you nothing but the best of luck. You too, Mike. Uh, nice to talk to you. Uh, you know, we shot the Blue Mountain State movie in Wilmington, North Carolina. You didn't know that, did you? No, I did not. I did not. But, yeah, we were, we were going to shoot it in Charleston. I mean, everybody was here, the crew, the cast, and then – we had some financial issues with uh, South Carolina and you know tax incentives, and um, I mean we just picked up and moved to Wilmington. I spent you know, a couple of weeks there. Well, it was a while ago, I guess. There you go. This is a tough place to, to leave, but maybe you'll maybe you'll come back. Maybe Blue Mountain State will come back as well at at some we, point. We are working on it, buddy. Believe me, I'm not giving that up. We got uh, might be a surprise coming down the line. 
There you go. We'll, we'll keep us uh, informed if that is, and we'll uh, we'll make sure to get it out there as well. And, and again, thanks so much for spending some time with us here today. All right, Mike. Hey, thanks a lot. It was good meeting you, and good luck. All right, you too. Stand Take go. care. Stand All go. right. Go Goats. <laughs> there you go. Well, again, my thanks to Ed Marinero for joining us here today, and uh, special thanks Chris Thomason with the Pioneer Press and Steve Rabel, one of our former guests for helping connect us with Ed and hear those stories here today. We thank you, as always, for watching or listening to today's episode and remind you once again to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time another edition of In the Front Row with Mike McCarroll. Have a great day, everybody.